As APC National Convention approaches, there is seemingly proverbial peace of the graveyard over many unresolved issues among the factions within different states. How would they navigate around these issues? What is the legitimacy or illegitimacy of different factions that have been sworn in even without hold of office? What about the Booney-led committee that has been piloting the affairs of APC? Our guest today, who will help us make sense of all these issues, is the former national legal advisor of APC, Dr. Muhiz Banire. Good day, sir. Good day. Okay, let's start by getting your opinion on the existence of factions in APC. What do you think? It is on record that you've said so many things about this before now. Well, you see, ordinarily, factions are not a bad, are not bad, so much of a bad development in the political party. But when it comes to a level in which there is an unhealthy rivalry among them, then it becomes a challenge. Um, the one in APC, for example, now is one that, in my very, very strong view, is capable of destroying the party properly. And it's already reflecting already. That much is already coming up because they are all operating at, in silos. These various uh, factions are operating in silos as if they are independent entity within the same enclave. So quite inevitably, what it will result to will be an implosion. Okay, let's be very specific now. There are some states, as we speak, states like Delta State, state like uh, um, even Quara, states like um, 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 Kanu, where we have them in court. Um, how do you think this should be resolved? Because I recall before the appeal court that was delivered recently, you know, the party recognized or even said that the committee should be led by Ganduje, who actually lost us at that time. Do you think the party is handling these issues very well? Because people will say that this is inevitable, but well, what about the handling? Uh, most of the uh, factionalization that they have now are, in my view, irreconcilable. Uh, to the extent that they, are, they were all predicated on fraud in the first instance. Uh, if, for example, is where you have had a fair playing ground, level playing ground for everybody, and somehow along the line that have been low-sided, then it could have been easily resolvable. But the one they have now is a situation where you find out that in all of them, the parallel, they are all parallel. So capacity to meet seems to be a mirage. And that is what they have right now. And for me, again, just like I predicted during the time that uh, Chiba Akonde was made the reconciliation chairman, and subsequently uh, Adamo Abdullah, I told them that all of them will end up as exercise in futility, which is what is certainly unveiling now, unfolding, that it's just complete waste of time of everybody. Because the truth of the matter is that there is no system where there is no respect for the rule of law that can survive. And if there is anything that APC is known for, it's violation of the rule of law, violation of even their own very constitution. And where you are searching, there is nothing you can do about resolution. In fact, the best that could happen to them is court intervention, judicial intervention. So for now, all those attempts or efforts will come to enough at the end of the day. Dr. Moyes, I will come back to where the foundation is, which you describe as fraud. But specifically, um, some of us are a bit confused, some political analysts. We have a case where the governor will say the faction led by the governor, and we have in Delta State the faction led by the deputy senate president. Is there a place for faction being attached to a sitting governor as the faction to be recognized in the APC constitution? Well, there is no provision like that saying that the governor's faction should prevail. But the truth of the matter is that pragmatically, it's the governor's faction that is largely recognized under this present regime. And it's simple. The, the logic is that what we have right now, that is the leadership architecture of APC now, is largely regulated by the governors. So by community solidarity, anything a governor does is uh, more or less uh, uh, acceptable to all of them and the critical committees. Secondly, the funding of the party is largely dependent on these governors. So 
when you look at that again, so the tendency is naturally to accommodate the interests of governor first and foremost before any other person. And that is exactly what is obtainable now. So you discover that in law of state, today we are the, the, we have factionalization. Those people that they, far, that they have acknowledged as the state chairman were those people purportedly elected at the Congress by the faction of the governor. And quite naturally, he will paste the piper, dictates the tune. But, but let's, let's look at uh, the build up to this convention uh, as we speak. Maybe um, the, the convention has been postponed, even when it's not being addressed. Some have claimed it's logistics, but some believe that it is the current crisis in different states. Do you predict a possible implosion and the party? I say this with a reference to what happened in PDP. You remember when PDP was going to lose the election? We saw the likes of Saraki, you know, move. Are you seeing... No, I've, said this, right? I've said this consistently in the last two and a half years to three years, that certainly the APC will implode. Uh, I've said it consistently, and that has been my position. So the truth of the matter is that in the first instance, the foundation of the party itself is weak. Weak in the sense that, you know, we are several people of different tendencies coming together to more or less acquire power. They acquire power instead of them establishing a synergy among all the various entities. They fail to do that. So what you now find out is a situation where, like I said initially, all these different tendencies were existing independent of each other. So conflict continue to be the order of the day. And that conflict is what is continuously tearing the party out, apart. And right now also is that the Congress, the purported Congress, they said they have had. If you ask them, they will tell you they were operated by way of consensus. They had no choice anyway, I must tell you. I've said it. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, now that I'm addressing, APC has no credible membership register. That you can say this is a register to conduct any primary or any Congress. So to that extent, the only way you could have gone about... So, Moise, it's, it's safe to say you were one of the founding members of this... I was. Party. I was, undoubtedly. So, uh, what happened? Uh, I, I'm seeing you exonerating yourself completely. Of course, as I am. You're not in the party. Of but how much of your voice? Of course, uh, of course. Unique. Of course, you are a living witness to all that transpired when I was nationally good advice. I fought them throughout on nothing other than compliance with the rule of law, which they refused. And immediately I had the opportunity of completing my tenure. I excused myself not only from the executive totally from the party because I realized that more or less I was keeping bad company of people who are not comfortable with the rule of law. And once you are not comfortable with the rule of law, you cannot be my friend or associate. So I left at that point in time. And the, all the things that I predicted, all the predictions that I made are daily coming into reality. Into Talking about your prediction now, I remember your stand about the Mela Bruni led uh, uh, committee. Um, some would say probably with this upcoming convention, would you put a stop to what you have described as illegality? Or let's look at what is really wrong with Mel Abuni. What is wrong is it is simple. Let's even leave the constitution of Nigeria, which you can argue here and there. No, you can argue here and there around that provision. But the one of APC, their own party, is very, very explicit. You don't need to be a lawyer to understand the import that you cannot be a government official in whatever capacity and be an official of, a, of the party. It's very explicit. In the constitution in the of, of APC, it's there, very, very explicit. So even if you don't understand the one in the Nigerian constitution, that one in your party says that you cannot hold that position. And that hint has been given to them by the APS court, which they are ignoring. But I'm sure that one day, that will come to haunt them again. Talking about the APS court, that, that I'm sure you're referring to the... Supreme Court of Nigeria. On, on those state... Uh, yes, yes. On the court judgment. But it appears they never heeded. And yeah. uh, is, is it that nobody challenged them in court? Because I think what the court said is that that was not joined in the suit. Exactly. But why hasn't anybody taken up this matter? I think that's on one or two matters in which they have been joined. But, for example, the number one, the issue was raised, but it, 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 the matter was decided on another point because there were, they had, the court had avalanche of evidence. 
to show that clearly that there was no primary. So on that basis, the case was decided. So there are about three other ones that are still ongoing. Okay, we are still listening to the interview, and I have with me Dr. Moise Banere, the former National Legal Advisor of APC. But before we go on a break, uh, let me bring in this question. There's no house somebody will be listening to Dr. Moise Banere now, and somebody will not want to know your take about what is happening, about the jostling for presidency, about the ticket in APC. What's your take? about your former boss who wants to become the next president of Nigeria? Well, I've said it consistently again that uh, uh, apart from the... I'm talking of Senator Bola to Yes, me. apart from the purported declaration at the villa, in which he also now said that, no, I've only come to inform the president, but I'm still doing consultation. I'm not aware, as far as that is contested, as at now that we are talking, no, I'm not aware. Okay, whether you're aware or you're not aware, doctor, what do you think about him, you know, expressing interest? Oh, of course, it's legitimate, very legitimate, all of them. The more the merrier. We need more people, but for me, if you ask me, of course, you know, I always support the younger ones. I prefer the younger ones. The younger ones? For obvious reason. Obvious. Yeah, no, Shibajo, is that the younger one? In fact, if you go by my own uh, threshold, he probably will not qualify to, because I'm of the view, just like Afe Babalala, that 60 years max should be the threshold. 60 years, man? 60. Okay, we'll take a short break, and when we come back, we'll talk more on this unfolding development. I have with me Dr. Moise Banire. Please don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the interview. I have with me Dr. Moise Banure, who is giving us some insight about his former party. I repeat, his former party, APC. But like you know, he's a stakeholder, he's one of the people who probably worked on the constitution and he's giving us an insight to what the party constitution talked about. Dr. Moise Banure, uh, still on who becomes the president of Nigeria. Um, we saw some bit of drama Again, these are the people you work with, uh, talking about the drama in Oshun State. What's your reaction about Godfatherism? People who want to stay in power. Your candid opinion, as you always do. I've always deprecated Godfatherism. I detest it in all ramifications. I can't stand this. If it's one of the greatest problems, evil, plaguing our political system today, it's what confers or gives words or first in us. Leadership that is inept, charlatans all over the old place. So I detest it. I told you, I can't even stand it. So, in this case, is it Tarek Beshola that is playing Godfatherism or the man from Bodilon using the language that is being used in Oshun State now? What do you think? Well, summarily, same or same. That's my reaction, same or same. Okay, you see, like, I said, like I said to a lot of people, I said, the template they've been using against each other for long and in their own favor is the same template that we ultimately haunt all of them. So just wait before the end of the year. More of them will shout again on the same template they've been using for long. They will just go and write results before, oppress people, electorally write everything. And, and you see, if you are, had opportunity to correct something and you fail, in that book, honestly, it will come to haunt you. And I think that's what is playing out, uh, playing out all over the whole place today. Because, Dr. because they think because they have all the power, the all money, they can do and undo. But I tell you for free. But Certainly. How, but how can we be free from Godfatherism? Well, there are, there are a lot of ways to be free. Uh, you are one of the problems, the very first problem, all of you elites. You will not go there because the people you have in the various political parties are largely the uninformed. I'm not talking about elite, uninformed. If we are able to even, then are just 10% of informed people in each of the political parties, we'll be able to reform those processes. But today, all the people there are largely the vulnerables. Those who are just looking, they are scavengers like they're looking forward to survive on. So with the crumb, they are ready to commit suicide. 
and those are the people there. So we need to populate the various political parties with good people. Right now, we have comfortable number of their majority being bad people. And these godfathers particularly take advantage of, they exploit them. They exploit their vulnerability. And that is what is going on. But, you know, for someone like us who probably follow you, we may not yeah. be, um, this may not come to us as a strange position. But some would say that uh, Dr. Moise Banure was also picked by these so-called godfathers. When has he become an activist who doesn't want godfathers to determine the next phase? Well, I've already answered that question one million times. In the first instance, <laughs> in, yes, in the first instance, I couldn't have been a beneficiary because I've never contested an election in my life. So I couldn't have been a beneficiary. You can only have godfatherism in a contest. That's why they impose. I've never contested anything before, never. But it is believed that you're a strong man, especially in your area, Mushin. Of course, you will be a strong man to the extent that you are able to convince the people to follow you. And even at that, even at that, if you go and find out from the people in Mushin, not on a single occasion have I imposed ordinary councillor, much less the council chairman. On them. Go and find out. In all the situation, I even totally estrange myself from it. I tell them, go and pick whoever you like. And I have my reason. The accusation of God for that reason. The truth of the matter is that most people, you are not sure of the person you are even recommending or imposing on them. So if at the end of the page, the person comes, start hurting them, it's your name they will be mentioning. So it's better to distance yourself. So I cleverly always distance myself. I don't want to get involved because I'm not waiting to eat to survive through the, any of those crooked means at all, because all these things are about crooked survivor, nothing else. So I've never been, and I will never be, because they will not even take a chance with me, because they know my tendency. You know, I have a very rebellious nature. So if you make a miscalculation of putting somebody like me anywhere, you might have to live to regret it. So it's much so more. Are you completely out of politics? For now, I'm completely out of uh, party politics. Of course, not governance issue. I'm still active in the governance, but I'm operating from the activist angle. For example, if Legosian said, we want someone like you to be their governor, oh, are I've you had, just going to turn them you down? See, because I've you are of, telling us to come. You see, I've had all those ones. I've had it. There's no problem about it, too. We can come home. But I tell you, when I come, one of the very first headaches I will have is that I do not see any reason why Somebody who wants to serve the people should be distributing money or sharing money, particularly if it's your hard earned money. That is the beginning of my challenge. So, if it is a matter of just about ideology or manifesto or convincing the people of your capability and what you want to do and your delivery, of course, I have no issue with that one. But here, yeah, as things are now, it's so much the, 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 the environment is so much polluted that particularly with these money bags. So except we are able to eliminate them and now provide a clean state, we are people of ideas, Mr. people of capacity. Of, of uh, no ambiguity, what do you mean by eliminate them? And when I say eliminate them, we have to clear them out of the space, political space, render them impotent. How? Oh, it's very easy now. That's why I say if we are able to get more good people into the political arena, we are able to indoctrinate, enlighten these vulnerable to know that these people do not mean well for you. If somebody comes to our food and starts sharing money, it certainly cannot mean well for you. It's only showing to reap. <laughs> it's not there to come and serve you. So we need a lot of education and enlightenment of the vulnerable who are in comfortable, comfortable majority in the various political parties, the market men, the trader, the artist. Those are the people who do not even understand the reason why they are voting, much less knowing even the person they are voting for. So these are the people we need to educate. We need to let them know that this one, this one, this one, if you see this, this, please run away from this fellow. So except we are able to do that, then again, most importantly by way of summary, I've said that separately too, that what happens in our system, particularly among the vulnerable, is that in each election that we have in Nigeria, electoral circle, you find out that now less than 70% of them that votes are people who constitute this vulnerable class. And they are unable to establish the nexus between their life and the vote. Most times they see that vote as a product. 
they merchandise it, they sell it, 2,000, 5,000, mm. and that's it. So except we are able to do that, to let them see that the same manner if somebody wants to strangle you or take your life, you struggle over it, it's the same manner you must struggle in respect of that singular vote. Mm. That is it. Okay, let me speak to you as a statesman that you are now, since yes. you are not aligning with any party. Yes. So what's your take about zoning? This is a topic, pragmatically using your word, that it's always coming up. Well, I must confess to you, up to about two years ago, I was not for zoning. I was for competence and marriage. But because of certain development that I noticed in the country, particularly the unfairness and injustice in the system, I'm convinced that there is a need for other regional to partake in it. So I'm more in favor of power shifting to the south now. Microzoned or just the south? Well, again, if you ask me about microzoning, I might be beaten up because <laughs> I, my tendency will be more in favor of southeast hmm. on point of equity. Are you for that? That's my. If I have to the be fair, my tendency will be for them because if you look at all the analysis, you can't so to advise the These people now. we have we have oppressed these people too much. Mm. If we look at look at the hierarchy of all the people occupying all the various positions in the country today, before you get to the exactly. eastern people, uh, southeastern people, uh, it's a long way. So what would be your advice to them? Some have said they are not strategically ready to take over. What would be your advice to the south? Well, they are not strategically not a problem at all. Any other zone in the <laughs> south can take it. Any other zone can take it if they're not ready. In clear times, I'm talking about the agitation being the destruction there. Some are yes, they are. For secession no, now. Yes, yeah, that's what I was going to say. You see, they are striving for secession because of the injustice and unfairness. So if you now, if I'm part of the reason why you must give them the opportunity to say, okay, you are the one complaint, take. Let's see how you two will do it. The secession struggle will die naturally. To die. It's one of the antidote to it. Okay, finally, before we go, um, um, some would say that uh, Dr. Moise Banire has come out again to give those strong words about the issues in our polity. So what's your final advice to those elites, those people who believe that we've lost faith in this country, the way out is to get out. I'm sure you're aware of the quantum of graduates that are traveling out of the country to UK, to different parts of Nigeria, I mean, different parts of the world. Well, if I have to be truthful, honestly speaking, I endorse it. I endorse it. Sorry, I didn't hear that. If I have, okay, let me put it in another way. If I have opportunity, I will move along with them. Wow. Because we have, in my view too, I might be wrong, I stand to be correct, we are virtually in a hopeless situation in the country. And so if people find Guinea pasture, honestly speaking, they should go quickly. They should run safe if they can run. <laughs> so that's my view of it. I don't discourage anybody again. I don't. If I encourage. Uh, this is a country where we have seen you succeed. We have seen you emerge as one of the best legal minds. This is a country where people have described you as one of the intelligent people who have gone into politics and transformed it in your own way. Why will you depict well, and first it's not yes, it's not about Moise Banre alone. No. It's not about my person, it's about the majority of the people who are the down troops. We are dying daily. For several reasons, ranging from insecurity to poverty to hunger. Those are the people we are talking about. And I tell you, maybe from my own vantage position again, I somehow I'm up, I'm pessimistic. I'm yet to see light at the end of the tunnel. The kind of the electoral system that you have now seems to me convincingly that it's incapable of birthing any credible leadership. And if I am unable one to... one or two of them you have serious issues with? It's not even about the personality. It's about the no, I mean system. The electoral system. Oh, there are so many... Uh, no, I will tell you uh, where it starts from. For example, let's look at the issue of the political party, the way the internal democracy, internal democracy is lacking. Nobody is enforcing, nobody is able to do it. The, even the corruption agencies are not able 
to deal with the situation. Can you imagine the kind of money, the kind of resources that is going all over right now that they are three, these people are still aspirant to, they're not even yet candidate. I know article is asking questions about the sources of this fund. And you think at the end of the day, you want something credible? No, it can't be. That's number one. Two, what is the quality? Look at their party now. <laughs> Look at it. The thing is going down. It's declining. Every electoral cycle is going down. Now, the last time we elected the president of Nigeria with less than 35% of the electorate. Registered voters, even. Yeah, that's what I said, electorate alone, mm. not even take not of the population, population of the electorate. This time around, if we are lucky, we might be lucky to have about 20%. Wow. Is that what it should be? And why is that so? It's because there are so many things that are militating against people participation, electronic transmission of result. Electronic voting is too crucial because the people are so much scared of their life that if you ask them to go and vote, they say, ah, I don't want to, mm, I don't want trouble, I don't want somebody to kill me or injure me. So these politicians to take advantage because they unleash, in quote, terrorists, the area boy, the miscreant, on the innocent voters. So those want the draw back. So at the end of the day, an average person you ask, him, like, I say, mm -mm. they've written their result, don't let me, wait. I don't want to waste mm. my time. <laughs> Vote don't count here, don't waste my time. Let them do whatever they like. That's what you find out. So where you still have this kind of feeling, then you do not expect anything positive. So for me, honestly, I'm a pessimist in this regard. So if you have, like uh, Adi Farazi said, don't only have <laughs> plan B, go and look for C already. <laughs> Dr. Moise, I, I will let you go until you <laughs> give us some kind of panacea to these problems. Yes. What do you think is the way out? The way out is very simple. One, we need to overhaul our electoral system totally. All this uh, patch patch <laughs> amendment is not the solution. We need to do things that are drastic. When I just start, people who will even contest, we must screen them to the extent. It might not be democratic, but we need it at this stage of our development. The best candidate must be the people that must be reflected on the ballot. We must probe, we must know you. We want to know your pedigree. Everybody must know who you are. Where is the source of you? We must know your money. That you, we must reduce the influence of money. It's when we are able to resolve that then you can start talking about reformation. And also, I've been saying it, that the constitution we even have in Nigeria is a disaster. It's not only complex, cumbersome, contradictory, and obsolete. I tell you for free, all these, again, so-called amendment, 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 that will be eternal, is not the solution. We need a brand new constitution that is re uh, realistic and that reflects the fundamentals and these fundamentals cannot come to be, except you have a national dialogue. If there is no national dialogue, you are wasting your time. There must be national dialogue. For me, the work done in 2014 through the CONFAB would have been an excellent product, but of course, for whatever reason, this government does not like it. My position is that even if you don't like the Jonathan one, because Jonathan convey, convey your own. The truth of the matter is that if we do not engage ourselves, the various ethnic nationalities in Nigeria don't engage themselves. Honestly, we cannot know peace in this country. We can't. Thank you so much, Dr. Moise Banure. Dr. Moise Thanks. Banure is the former national legal advisor of the ruling APC. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. I'm afraid this is how far we can go on the interview this week. The interview comes up next week when we have another interesting guest. I am Kayodi Ladendi.